Kelf. Um, and thank you to QuesMed and Study Hub for having me for today's lecture, which is going to be SBAs on ophthalmology. So um, the way it will work is that uh, there's quite a lot of SBAs here, actually, which are a very nice whiz through um, some of the key and high yield areas of ophthalmology for finals and your specialty years. Um, I've not written the SBAs. They're from the QuesMed Bank. So we'll have the SBA. I won't read it because apparently Yezen once asked attendees if they prefer the person presenting to read or not to read. So I won't read it. We'll just give you like a minute to do the question. We'll do the poll. And then we'll take you through why the right answer is right, why the wrong answers are wrong. And then I've basically interspersed each SBA with some slides and teaching and revision so that hopefully we can cover most of the high yield topics in ophthalmology. Um, these are the topics for discussion today. Um, as you can see, they're a nice whiz through of some of the most important um, areas in ophthalmology for the undergraduate curriculum. We won't be able to <coughs> cover everything. And... At times, it might be a little bit simplistic, but I really believe that doing the simple things best is the best way to do fantastically well. So um, if you know these core topics well, you're doing well. Um, just a shout out to myself. Um, I made a Facebook page because I do lots of teaching. Um, I studied at UCL, so I've got teaching resources which are kind of uh, tailored to UCL exams. Um, but essentially, I teach fourth and fifth years and final years at UCL. Um, so if you're a clinical student and you study any of the general medical specialties uh, or special or like, you know, the specialty areas like this, for example, ophthalmology, peds, obs and gynae, etc. I've got quite a few webinars planned for July. So if you are interested, then go over to my page. You just search in Facebook, Adam Ali Teaching, and you can find the page. Give it a like or a follow or whatever. But on there, there'll be some updates. OK, without further ado, let's start. So this is the first question. Okay, last ten seconds and five. Okay, good. So there's, um, I don't know if you guys can see the answers, but I'll, I'll read out the spread. Essentially, this is quite a spread out SBA. So uh, most of you, 55% went for the right answer, which is A, which is lash follicle swelling, because basically this question asks you to decide. So it's interesting because the kind of, the, the just the lead in, which is the last sentence is all you really need to read. Um, and it's asking you which of these things makes it a sty. A sty is a staphylococcal infection and essentially a small abscess of an eyelash follicle. And that's why A is the right answer. Um, second, next answer was painlessness. So those of you that ha have had a sty will know that that is not painless. It's very painful. Um, umbilicated papules is another answer that people have gone for, which is uh, classically something you will see in molluscum cont contagiosum. So the right answer is A. Um, this is uh, the answers from QuesMed Spank. So as you can see here, a sty or external hordeolum is an abscess in a lash follicle. Um, pointing inwards is a feature of a Calasian, which we'll go on in a sec. I think that's a bit niche and weird, to be honest with you. Um, like I went through this SVA and I was like, right, ophthalmology, obviously I'm going to smash this, it's going to be good. And the way this was the first question, I just got it wrong. So it's quite, <laughs> I think this is a hard question, actually. Um, painlessness here, again, one that you all went for, uh, or a lot of you went for, but incorrect because Calasian is classically painless and then umbilicated papules will be a sign of mollusca. So uh, just to run through that quickly, I just wanted to start by going over eyelid diseases. Um, essentially, uh, one of these common primary care presentations, and actually I was watching a lecture the other day, this is quite a common presentation to ocular a and as well, but blepharitis, which is uh, inflammation of the eyelid margin. Um, and this is an example where you might see redness and collarettes at the bases of the lashes. Um, these are just copy and pasted from the NHS website. Um, and basically the treatment is going to be lid hygiene. So that's using warm compresses 
cotton wool or buds with like soap or shampoo to just clean the eyelids. Um, and sometimes you would recommend topical antibiotics, maybe. But blepharitis is a very common presentation in uh, primary care. Um, but moving on to what this question was about, which is lumps of the eyelid. Um, I've kind of summarized it down quite a lot, but essentially there's two important differentials. It's either going to be a painless lump, which is a calasian, or a painful lump, and that's going to be a sty, also known as external hordeolum. Um, and this is like a summary table that I've made. I'm just going to try and move this out of the way. Um, so starting with a calasian, this is the commonest type of lid lump. Um, it's classically painless. This is the one where one of the options said points inwards. So apparently if you read, I saw this in the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Specialties, which is like your go-to for some of the specialty years. But um, essentially a calasian is caused by blockage of the meibomian glands, which are oil, oil glands on the eyelid margin. And if they get blocked, you'll get a lipogranulomatous swelling or inflammation. So it's classically painless. And then sty is painful, and that's also called an external hordeolum, and it's a staphylococcal abscess of a lash follicle. So when you examine, there'll be a lash inside because it's inflammation of the lash base. Um, and these are patients you would also treat with warm compresses. Um, but you can also think about oral antibiotics if there is cellulitis of the eyelid, uh, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then the, the confusing thing for me has always been, there's also a thing called an internal hordeolum, which is not blockage of a meibomian gland like in a calasian, but infection of a meibomian gland. So it's kind of a sty to, but I would say the most important differential is calasian painless, sty painful. One is a blockage of a meibomian gland. One is a staphylococcal infection of a lash follicle. Again, this is from the NHS website. Um, picture of a sty kind of looks pus filled. You can see there's yellowness in the middle of that lump. Um, and this, I think, is a good picture because this shows you a person with a sty. You can even see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if you look at the lump, there is a lash follicle right at the peak of that lump. So that is going to be a sty. And you can see that there's quite marked inflammation and swelling of the upper eyelid, the whole eyelid. So that's called cellulitis. And those are patients you would typically give oral antibiotics. And if you saw this person in the emergency department or in general practice, the most important thing to do would be, would be to decide if they have preceptal cellulitis or orbital cellulitis, which is when your inflammation tracks posteriorly back into the eye. And that may be suggested by signs of optic neuritis. So this is a very, very important concept to have in your mind of what kinds of physical signs are going to be suggestive of optic nerve dysfunction. And maybe you can think about it for a sec, but the key answers are going to be a decrease in the visual acuity, an RAPD, a decrease in color vision, or pain on ocular movement. So I would say those are the four really, really important ones that you need to be thinking about. Good, next question. Okay, 20 seconds left. And 10 seconds. Yeah, this one's easy. Every, basically everyone went for the right answer, which is E, conjunctivitis. So um, this is someone with hyperemia, redness, lacrimation, that means tearing of the eyes. They've got normal visual acuity, normal pupillary reflectors. I think this is quite a clear description of someone with irritation, redness of both eyes. The crusting on waking again is something that should make you think of conjunctivitis. Um, similar spread in the Quez Med Bank. Um, all the other types of pathology we're going to go over shortly anyway. So um, conjunctivitis means inflama inflammation of the conjunctiva. As you know, the suffix itis means inflammation of X. Um, there's lots of causes. 
Um, I would generally say the most important ones to be aware of are infectious causes, and that could be any pathogen, so bacterial, viral, uh, fungal even. Um, and then you have like allergic atopic conjunctivitis as well, which actually probably sounds like what's being described in this question, because this person says uh, they describe a two-week history of itchy eyes. I think somewhere it says they get this around this time of year. So you should be thinking about things like allergic conjunctivitis. Um, the symptoms that are going to be reported are itchiness, pain, uh, gritty or foreign body sensation, and discharge or tearing. And that's called lacrimation. I'll talk about viral conjunctivitis in a moment. Um, but the treatment is going to be warm compresses, lid hygiene, hand hygiene to stop the spread because it's going to be quite contagious. And sometimes you will see that topical chloramphenicol drops or ointment are given, um, especially if bacterial conjunctivitis is suspected. Viral conjunctivitis, just like viral upper respiratory tract infections, are very common um, and obviously will not really benefit from treatment with antibiotics. Um, one of the things that you might see in single best answers is that these are particularly contagious types of conjunctivitis. So you might have, for example, a family where two or three people in the family have all had bilateral red eyes, which are itchy and gritty, and they get lots of lacrimation. One of the classical findings, uh, physical examination findings, is preauricular lymphadenopathy, which means they'll have swollen lymph nodes anterior to the ear. Um, so you might see that in a question. And just remember that hand hygiene, because this is particularly contagious, is very important. Um, topical chloramphenicol won't really benefit patients like this. Um, and to be honest with you, it won't really benefit people with bacterial conjunctivitis either. Most cases of bacterial conjunctivitis self-resolve within a few days. Um, and I think I was reading one study when I was doing a bit of an audit on this. Uh, and from memory, bacterial conjunctivitis decreases the duration of the conjunctivitis illness, the natural history, by about half a day. So if you take topical chloramphenicol, it will decrease your symptoms from like five days to four and a half days on average. So you can kind of just advise people to do warm compresses. Next question. Hey, 10 seconds. Yep, so 63% of you went for the correct answer, which is B, CRVO. This is um, actually a really, really uh, easy question. And the reason is because all this stuff is, all the stuff at the first four lines is like, kind of relevant and then you see the words stormy sunset appearance and you just go b and move on so that is a very very classical appearance of the fundus examination finding in patients with crvo it's called the stormy sunset appearance caused by uh, dilated and tortuous vessels in addition to hemorrhages of the retina so that's a very very classical buzzword for sbas again we're going to talk about all the other causes the important things to note from this sba are that this 64-year-old woman has a history of hypertension and diabetes. So those are vascular risk factors. And essentially, central, central retinal vein occlusion is like a thrombosis of the retinal vein. So anyone with a prothrombotic state, anyone with vascular disease, um, is going to have an increased likelihood of, or increased risk of developing this condition. Um, also, just a word that I see, your, I see you guys as Q&As, and I'll answer all the questions at the end. Um, we're going to talk about the rest of this stuff later. Next question.
10 seconds. Seems to be a harder one, people are. Mm. We'll give them time. Okay, just to allow more people to vote, I'm going to give it five more seconds. Very generous of you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so again, as uh, with most things, uh, most people got the correct answer. I think this one is a little bit harder, actually. So I'm going to go through the question. 50-year-old person, essentially they are presenting with a painless loss of vision. That is essentially what has happened here. Um, they've got hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Again, those are vascular risk factors. Um, actually, the way this SBA is structured, just like the last one, is that the first six lines actually don't matter, although they give very important history that will suggest the diagnosis. The actual question is, which of the following suggests the diagnosis of Crow or central retinal artery occlusion? So I'm going to go through each one. Painful ocular movement is going to be suggestive of optic neuritis, because if the optic nerve is inflamed and it's at the back of the eye, when the eye moves, it's going to pull on the optic nerve, so it will be painful. Carotid brewery is the correct answer. Um, and that's because uh, this essentially, CRAO is essentially a type of stroke. It's basically a stroke. So a lot of the um, central, retinal, central retinal artery occlusions are going to, or any retinal artery occlusion for that matter, can be because of thromboembolic disease. So just like in stroke, someone has a stroke, you look for the cause. Like for example, mitral valve disease or atrial fibrillation, uh, retinal artery occlusion is similar. So if someone's got a carotid brewery, that is going to be indicative of internal carotid artery atherosclerosis or carotid artery atherosclerosis. And therefore, it's likely that they've thrown off a clot from the carotid artery. So that's the correct answer. Um, and for most of these people, you'll get an ultrasound Dopplers of the carotid to demonstrate atherosclerosis. Um, and then retinal, option C, retinal hyperemic hemorrhages, that is not specific to anything. That might be something that you see in diabetic retinopathy. Uh, classically, you would see it in uh, a central retinal vein occlusion as well. Jaw claudication is a classical feature of, as I'm sure many of you know, GCA, joint cell arteritis. And then photopsia, which is flashing lights and floaters, are a classical description of the symptoms experienced in patients with retinal detachment. And then here's a nice question for you, which we're not going to cover. If you have a carotid brewery and someone has internal carotid artery stenosis, what degree of stenosis would be an indication for carotid endoterectomy? This is like a classic SBA that comes up. I'll let you think about that in a sec. And then I'll tell you, because obviously we're not going to cover that answer, is 70% classically. Um, so there are going to be times where I branch out away from ophthalmology, and I hope you'll forgive me. But I think that medicine is very um, interconnected. So if you can connect ophthalmic SBAs to other uh, specialties and other systems, that is a very helpful approach, especially for seeing patients in real life. So um, we've just done an SBA on CRVO and CRAO, and I'm just going to quickly go over uh, the ways that you can tell the difference. Um, just briefly to start with, a reminder of fundus examination. So I know that in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, um, OSCEs are kind of canceled. So this doesn't matter that much, but um, it's certainly something you need to know because um, there will be lots of, or some scenarios in real life where fundoscopy will add a small amount of information. So you still need to do how, know how to do fundoscopy. Um, the way I learned it at medical school was to, when you do fundoscopy, to check the three Cs and then examine the peripheral retina. The three Cs are to look at the optic nerve head and look at the cup, because you'll remember that the cup to disc ratio is increased in glaucoma, especially in chronic open angle glaucoma. Then I would look at the color of the disc, because if it's very bright or very pale, that might be indicative of optic atrophy, which means death of the optic nerve. And then contour, which means to look at the line, kind of the lining of the disc and see, is that sharply demarcated or is it blurred? Because if it's blurred, that's a classical finding of swelling of the optic nerve head or papilledema. We will go into all of these things in some depth in a moment. So I would examine cup color contour, and then you're going to examine the peripheral retina. So you're going to look at the arcades of vessels that move superiorly and inferiorly away from the disc. You're going to look for dot and blot hemorrh hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, which are signs of diabetes, hypertension, and then look at the macula. So to summarize that, when you examine someone's fundus, and actually uh, just preceding that by a minute, before you examine someone's fundus, you need to examine for the red reflex. You remember that you look from a distance and flash the fundoscope at their eyes, usually in dark light, and look for the red reflex. And if it's absent, you're going to be thinking about things like a cataract, or if it's a child retinoblastoma. Then you're gonna examine the fundus, look at the cup color contour, and then you're gonna look at the vessels, the peripheral retina, and the macula. 
This, these are pictures of normal fundi, which I've taken from Google. This is what a normal fundus looks like. This is the, this is the uh, optic nerve head. These are the vessels that move inferiorly anteriorly. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I am pointing to stuff, I promise. And then this is the macula centrally. So again, on the right hand side, this is a, a one I got off Google with annotations. Um, I wanted to show you this article, which I just found recently, which I think is a very nice article um, that has lots of really, really pretty pictures. So I'm just referencing it here if you want to go and search it. But I, I just wanted to focus on the optic nerve head here because I think this is a really nice annotation just to clarify any um, confusion. So the cup is like, it's kind of like a ring donut. So like the hole is the cup and the disc is like the donut. And the, the difference between those two, that's called the neuroretinal rim. So that's the cup, that's the disc. So the cup to disc ratio or CDR is to say, what is the size of this in proportion to this? And it should be less than a third. If it's more than a third, that's something you're going to be seeing in chronic open angle glaucoma. So this is a very nice article, but I'm referencing here to put more pictures in later. This is a very classical appearance, which you should all be able to immediately diagnose. This is like a spot diagnosis, but you can see that there is blurring of the optic disc. So this is the classical finding that you will see, especially if you get these pair of fundi. That means there's bilateral optic nerve head swelling. They probably have papilledema, but you would not be able to say that someone has papilledema without demonstrating that they have raised intracranial pressure. So just uh, very briefly, this is a very important examination finding. It's a very, very significant spot diagnosis. This is the differential diagnosis um, taught to me by, by one of my good mentors, Dr. Bainan, of blood optic nerve discs. So I thought I'll reference people as I go here. Um, so the first is called papillitis, which is inflammation of the optic nerve head. Essentially, you might not necessarily, because you can have something where you get inflammation of the optic nerve head, sorry, of the optic nerve behind the optic nerve head. Uh, which is called retrobulbar optic neuritis. And then theoretically, you won't see any, um, any papillitis. But if you see optic nerve head inflammation, um, you're probably going to see that in optic neuritis, especially at the level of finals. So these are your kind of 20 to 40 year old women who come in with an episode of weakness or an episode of red eye or painful eye. You probably think they have multiple sclerosis. You can't prove that until you de demonstrate that they have lesions disseminated in time and space. And that can normally be done with an MRI of the head. But essentially, that's going to be your most important cause, papillitis or optic neuritis. And then CRVO. So we didn't mention this at the time, but when you've got a patient with CRVO, in addition to the stormy sunset appearance, you might have a loss of the, um, of the uh, contour of the optic nerve head. It might become blurred. Malignant hypertension, which is hypertensive eye disease that usually progresses in a fairly rapid manner. And that may be associated with a macular star, which we'll talk about later. And then papilledema, which means bilateral optic nerve head swelling in the context of raised intracranial pressure. It's a very, very specific ophthalmic diagnosis. Most people, when they see a blurred optic nerve head disc margin, will say papilledema. That's not necessarily correct because papilledema has to be in that context. Bilateral raised intracranial pressure. Um, and then just briefly running through some of the common causes that you might encounter of raised intracranial pressure at the undergraduate stage. Uh, commonly neoplastic disease, so cancer, which is either going to be a primary cerebral tumor or a metastasis from somewhere else. So these are going to be patients that might present to the emergency department with a seizure and no history of epilepsy. You scan their head, usually a CT head with angiogram, and then you're going to see CT head with contrast, and you're going to see ring enhancing lesions, which are suggestive of neoplastic disease. Um, you also have IIH, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is a very classical thing you might see in SBAs. Think about this condition in young women who are obese or with increased body habitus. They might be on the oral contraceptive pill. They might have a headache. These patients will classically have bilateral optic nerve head swelling, uh, and the cause will be um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So that would be called papilledema because they normally have uh, intracranial hypertension, which you'll see on an LP. Um, and then infective space occupying lesions. So when you're learning about, for example, HIV medicine, you might come across patients with multiple ring enhancing lesions because of toxoplasmosis, or for example, a patient with a cerebral abscess from endogenous infection. And then as a complication of intracranial bleeding. So um, this is something that I discussed in a neurology lecture that I have, but one of the consequences of, for example, uh, MCA, uh, middle cerebral artery infarctions, is something called the dense MCA syndrome, in which you can have subsequent uh, intracranial swelling, and then obviously you're going to get raised intracranial pressure. So just a few other examples of raised ICP that you might see at the undergraduate level. 
These are all from Google. Unfortunately, I've not really practiced ophthalmology clinically, so I don't have any pictures of my own. I usually love showing pictures of patients to bring home the realness of medicine, but I can't this time. I've got a few, but not the fundi. Um, so these um, fundus photos are all of the same thing. You can see that the optic nerve head in the disc is very, very pale, and that's called optic atrophy. So just think about that when you see someone with a very pale disc. In my experience, it does not really feature much in exams, actually. Um, and then generally, you can think about the causes as either congenital or acquired. The congenital causes are all kind of slightly rarer genetic conditions. So you, had Wolf, you have Wolfram syndrome, or the Did-Moad syndrome, which you may remember if you covered it in perhaps endocrinology, maybe. So Did-Moad stands for diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, optic atrophy, and deafness. So obviously, they all have optic atrophy. Kern Sayers, which is a mitochondrial condition in which patients get a kind of chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Leber's congenital amaurosis, again, a fairly rare genetic condition. And then you have acquired causes of optic atrophy. So glaucoma, especially at the end stages of chronic open angle glaucoma, you're likely to develop death of the optic nerve and therefore they'll have a pale disc. Uh, ischemic causes like giant cell arteritis, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, um, patients with long-standing multiple sclerosis or demyelination, obviously they're all um, they're susceptible to recurrent attacks of optic neuritis and therefore you might get death of the optic nerve. B12 deficiency is a very, very classical cause of optic nerve disease, which you also see as a cause of optic neuritis and trauma. Okay, so <clears throat> we also did an SBA on uh, retinal artery occlusion. These are the classical fundus findings in patients with art artery occlusion. So this, as I'm sure many of you will know, is called the cherry red spot. And classically, what you can see is a very, very pale retina where the macula is quite dark. Um, and that's because the macula has dual blood supply. So in addition to the central retinal artery, there's going to be other blood supply, which will perfuse the macula and keep it essentially red. And then if you look at the photo on the right, again, these are both from Google, this one's from iRounds. Um, you can see that the pala is actually restricted to the kind of top half of the fundus. So that's called a branch retinal artery occlusion, i.e. not the whole retina has been occluded. And that's why if you look at the macula, it doesn't look very cherry already. Um, just a quick uh, mention of these two uh, conditions that you might have come across in pediatrics, neiman pick and Tayman's tay sachs These are conditions that can affect particularly Ashkenazi Jewish populations. Um, and they might have other features, for example, um, regression when you uh, perform a developmental assessment. Um, but you might examine them and find a cherry red spot. Um, this is uh, something from a discussion I had with one of my ophthalmology, one of my friends who's a registrar in ophthalmology. Essentially, in clinic, when patients come in with a painless uh, loss of complete loss of vision and they're found to have a CRAO, you then treat them like a stroke. So the management is to give 300 milligrams of aspirin uh, after ruling out any signs of hemorrhage. Uh, and then you're going to hunt for the causes of stroke like mitral valve disease, atrial fibrillation, you're going to examine, well, no one's going to listen, unfortunately, to the carotids, but even if you did auscultate a brewery over the carotids, you would then proceed to an ultrasound Doppler of the carotids. And then these are some of the things that additionally are done sometimes, like IV acetazolamide, anterior chamber paracentesis, but these are uh, generally not very effective. This is a very nice paper that I found the other day, which shows a branch retinal artery occlusion. You can see here on the right-hand side, that half the retina has gone white. And these yellow dots, which are called Hollenhorst plaques. These are emboli of cholesterol. So th that's like an eponymously named physical sign that you might find in someone with, with retinal artery occlusion. These, again, are from Google. This is a very, very classical fundus examination finding for someone with this beautiful stormy sunset appearance. You can see the tortuous dilated retinal vessels with hemorrhages. And again, if you look at the optic nerve head, I could perhaps convince you with an eye of good faith that the optic nerve head margin is blurred. So you would say that this person does not have papilledema, but they have blurring of the disc. And the differentials for that, as we mentioned earlier, are CRVO, which this is, malignant hypertension, papillitis, and papilledema. That's what we just said. That's some more pictures of CRAO that I took from the internet. Next question. So Adam, there's just been a few requests in the chat if, uh, to slow down a little bit, if possible. Okay, we'll do. Thank 
Okay, 10 more seconds. <clears throat> okay. So uh, again, the majority of you, 77% have gone for um, the correct answer, which is B. Uh, so if you look at this SBA, you'll see this is a 50-year-old man who's attending for a diabetic review. So we know he has diabetes. Um, and the fundoscopy finding is dilated vessels, which are tortuous, and cotton wool spots, which are indicative of retinal ischemia, and then hemorrhages. So that is going to, I mean, that's basically not mild. So I would say if you're looking at the options, do we think this is diabetic maculopathy? Not really, because the macula is the center of vision, and that's not really what this person has reported. It's not going to be CRV, O, or AO, although, as we just discussed, diabetes is a cause of uh, or a risk factor for the development of both of those. So, really, the question would be narrowed down to whether or not this is proliferate, uh, sorry, severe or mild. And I would say, on the basis of those findings, it's going to be severe, which is what this says too. So, uh, just to cover diabetic retinopathy, um, so there are, there are actual scoring systems that are used by trainees uh, and ophthalmologists in practice, um, which I think are quite complex and I don't really think are part of the undergraduate curriculum uh, to know them off by heart. But essentially, the way you can think about diabetic retinopathy is that it's either going to be pre-proliferative, proliferative, or going to feature some maculopathy. So the pre-proliferative retinopathy are patients with uh, dot blot hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, those are going to be pre-proliferative changes. Proliferative retinopathy is when you have new vessel formation, as the name suggests. So if you have an SBA and it says that there are new vessels forming, then you know it's proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And the final stage is maculopathy, where you can see a whole range of changes at the macula. So those are kind of broadly speaking, in a summarized version, the three kind of stages or different types of diabetic retinopathy. And again, this picture is from Google. I just wanted to take a moment to talk about hypertensive retinopathy. Um, again, this is, a, this is um, not something we're going to have an SBA on, so I thought I'd just cover it quickly. Uh, essentially, the summarized version of this is that the stages of hypertensive retinopathy are silver wiring, AV nipping, dot blot hemorrhages, and then papilledema. So again, I'd just like to direct you to this paper, which I found recently, which I think is a very, very nice uh, summary on hypertensive retinopathy just referencing it because there are some very nice pictures in it. And that's where these pictures on the right are from. So this stage one, you can see the narrowing of the vessels, which is kind of another way of saying silver wiring. Um, and then AV nipping, uh, here in this second picture, you can see photograph shows arteriovenous nicking. Again, I think these are more things that you would be expected to recognize from an SVA written rather than being presented with a fundus and asked to decide if it is stage one or stage two hypertensive retinopathy. So as long as you recognize these buzzwords from SBAs. This is stage three. So you can see that now there are cotton wool spots, which are, as I mentioned earlier, suggestive of uh, ischemia of the retina and retinal hemorrhages that you can see all here. Again, from the same paper. And then this is a slightly different paper. So this is my like favorite column in the world. This is called Images in Clinical Medicine, which is a column in the New England Journal where they essentially publish nice pictures. Um, and this is a case that you can look up. Uh, this is hypertensive retinopathy in the context of preeclampsia. So you'll know that when you cover obstetrics, um, preeclampsia is one of the uh, kind of very common comorbidities that need to be managed in, uh, in women with hypertension after 20 weeks with proteinuria. Um, and if they have malignant hypertension, uh, then they can have hypertensive retinopathy, as we've just alluded to. So again, silver wiring, AV nipping, you can certainly see the hemorrhages here. That I'm pointing to in my mouse, if you can see that. You can see the macular star, which is like a, a collection of exudates at the macula, which again goes along with hypertensive retinopathy, but it's not really specific to it, but something you might see. And again, if you look at the optic nerve head, they've actually called this one papilledema. So they've mentioned that in the text here somewhere. Um, so Essentially, uh, again, just a reminder that malignant hypertension is going to be a cause of a blurred optic nerve disc. So that's why I thought this was a particularly nice paper to show you. And I will uh, be picking some more examples from images in clinical medicine too, because they've got very nice pictures. Next question.
second. Okay, so the majority of you again have gone for the correct answer, which is painful ocular movement. So again, this is someone that's presenting with uh, photophobia, redness of the eye, um, no particular medical history, but normal pupils. Um, and then essentially the question is whittled down in the last sentence, which of these would support a diagnosis of scleritis, not episcleritis? And the correct answer is painful ocular movement. These are the answers from the QuesMed Bank. So um, the idea is that uh, with scleritis, you have inflammation of the sclera, which is where the extraocular muscles insert. So when you move the eye, that will irritate that already inflamed lining of the eye, and therefore there will be pain on eye movement. Hyperemia means redness of the eye. That's not really specific to one or the other. Um, acute onset, both can be acute onset. Visual acuity, generally unaffected. And photophobia, generally in both. So this is just a summary table that I've made um, of scleritis and episcleritis. Essentially, episcleritis is quite a benign condition, um, and this is actually the one that may be more red. So even though it's benign, it can be a bit more red. Um, the pain is uh, present, but it's not awful, and typically you can treat these patients with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. But in comparison, scleritis, which is inflammation of the sclera, which is a deeper layer of the, of the eye, um, has an association with other connective tissue diseases. So cl classically, vaginous granulomatosis can cause scleritis, and this can be a very serious ocular complication. The eye might not be that red, but the pain classically in SVAs is described as deep and boring. So if they have very, very severe pain, you're going to be thinking more about scleritis. And as covered in the SVA, <coughs> they may also have pain on eye movement. So these patients aren't treated with NSAIDs, but more like steroids and immunosuppression. So scleritis is certainly a more severe manifestation of this disease. Episcleritis is uh, more mild and benign. Next question. Five more seconds. Okay, so again, most of you have gone for the correct answer, but it's quite a big spread. Um, and the people that made a mistake made the same one that I did. So this is a person with acute angle closure glaucoma. We're going to cover why that's the cause, but essentially they have an acute abdomen, they have vomiting, and they have headache, they have a red eye. Um, and it's made much more specific by the information that they have a fixed mid-dilated pupil, classic finding of ACG, angle closure glaucoma, cloudy cornea, also classical finding, and the visual acuity is down, the intraocular pressure is markedly raised. So it's obviously angle closure glaucoma. The last three options I would immediately cross off. Sumatriptan is uh, something that you use for migraine, oral or intravenous acetazolamide, um, does have a role in angle closure glaucoma, but the question asks you what the definitive treatment is, and that's normally going to be surgery. Um, so the correct answer is answer B. So you need to perform iridotomy. So you get a laser and you make basically make a hole in the iris in both eyes to allow an increased outflow of aqueous humor so that you can decrease the intraocular pressure. And actually the spread is quite similar to that on the QuizMed Bank. Um, but essentially, I, when I didn't know about this, I would have thought that A was the right answer because the right eye is affected, so you do iridotomy in the right eye, but that's not correct. So the correct answer is bilateral peripheral laser iridotomy because of a risk to the other eye. Okay, so just a bit on uh, glaucoma. Essentially, glaucoma is an optic 
neuropathy, so death of the optic nerve, which is closely associated with raised intraocular pressure. So it's not necessarily caused by it, but it's closely associated with it. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, if you see that someone on examination has an increased cut to disc ratio of more than a third, then you might be thinking about chronic open angle glaucoma. And some of the features that you might see in this are patients with a slow loss of vision, it might be associated with ocular hypertension, they might have peripheral visual field loss, and also classically an arcuate scotoma on perimetry. That's open angle glaucoma. And then closed angle or angle closure glaucoma, ACG. This is a medical and ophthalmical emergency. These patients will have a headache, they'll have a, an acute abdomen, they might have a red painful eye. The classical ocular examination findings are a fixed oval shaped pupil that responds or reacts poorly to light. They're going to have a cloudy cornea because of edema in the cornea because of dysfunction due to raised intraocular pressure. And if you have a cloudy or cloudy uh, cornea, which is like the window out of your eye, then you might see that the question features something like halos around bright lights. The management in um, angle closure glaucoma is going to be things like acetazolamide, which we mentioned just now, pilocarpine, which will constrict the pupil and pull the peripheral iris out of the closed angle to allow an increased drainage of aqueous humour, and as we mentioned just now, bilateral peripheral laser iridotomy as kind of a definitive form of surgical management. So again, this is the paper that I referenced earlier about optic nerve head changes in glaucoma. I thought it was a really, really nice paper because there's nice pretty pictures. Um, and essentially you can see here, this is meant to be, this is the cup in here and the disc. And you'd say that the cut to disc ratio here is about 0 0.2 or one over five, which obviously is less than a third. So that's good news. And then in uh, the middle panel, panel B, you can see that the cut to disc ratio is definitely increased. And here they've estimated it at 0.7. So you can see that it's just become much more elongated as a proportion of the disc. And then in panel C, which is on the far right, you can see that the cup to disc ratio is nearly one, i.e. the cup occupies almost all of the disc, and that's a sign of severe or advanced glaucoma. And again, another really, really nice panel from that paper that I referenced, but this is someone with progression of um, uh, glaucoma. So you can see that their cut to disc ratio is certainly elevated. It's more than a half here on the far left in 1988. And you can see that as you progress through time, that cut just gets bigger and bigger and occupies a bigger proportion of the disc. So very, very nice pictures in that paper. This is another images in clinical medicine that I thought was a very nice, uh, really beautiful manifestation of angle closure glaucoma. So you can see in the, in the write-up that it's a 52-year-old woman uh, with severe retrobulbar pain, retrobulbar pain and blurred vision in the left eye. You can see that the left eye is red. You can see that the pupil is fixed, dilated. They state in here that there's a poor response to light. Um, you can't really see a cloudy cornea, but maybe you could convince yourself. But that's a very, very nice picture of acute angle closure glaucoma. Next question. Okay, 10 seconds left. Okay, so quite a spread. So this one is a bit harder. I, I, I struggled with this one as well. So this one is a bit harder. So the correct answer is B, and only 43% of you have gone for that one. So actually not most of you got the right answer. So again, this is um, kind of the last sentence really is the question, which is which of these suggests dry AMD? Um, and this is uh, a woman who's slightly older. She's 70 years old. Um, so already those are two risk factors for AMD, increasing age and female sex. She has a history of cataract, um, and you notice that she's got yellow deposits at the macula. So going through these, 
uh, glare from bright light. That's a classical, uh, well, we'll go to the Quesman answers as well, but glare from bright light is classically an SBA clue as to the presence of cataract. Perish peripheral visual field loss, that's something you might see in glaucoma. You might see that in patients, for example, with a pituitary macroadenoma, if they have bitemporal hemianopia, it's not something that's going to feature in AMD. You will actually get a loss of the central vision where, where the fovea is essentially. Um, pale optic disc, again, that's optic atrophy. Uh, and then flashes and floaters, those are signs of retinal detachment. So the correct answer is visual fluctuation, um, which is this suggestion that patients' um, vision kind of seems better on some days and seems a bit worse on others. It's not a classical thing I've actually come across. When I uh, first did this SBA, I picked B because I thought it meant metamorphopsia, which is a very, very specific um, feature that you will see in AMD. So we'll go into that in a second, but it's not. So AMD, age-related macular degeneration. Um, patients will classically get a slow onset of loss of central vision. This is a nice photo. Uh, the links are in the bottom left, uh, references for these photos, where you can see lots of drusen, these kind of yellow deposits at the macula. Um, and the risk factors are, some of the important ones are age, advancing age, female sex, Caucasian, and smoking. So um, you would try and address those in the management. And one of the other things is to give patients an AMSLA grid, which is this grid here in the top right corner. And essentially you ask the patient to close one eye, look at the dot, and if there's any waviness, that is a suggestion of worsening of the AMD. And that is called metamorphopsia, which is very specific for AMD. So just as a summary table, again, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that there's this kind of distinction between dry and wet AMD. Essentially, dry AMD is something we can't really do much about in terms of surgical management. Um, both of them are going to have drusen and yellow accumulations of uh, extracellular waste at the back of the eye, which is what the drusen are. The symptoms are going to be gradually declining visual acuity and metamorphopsia, which is that waviness of lines, waviness of straight lines that you might see. And the management for dry AMD is focused on smoking cessation and dietary changes. So there are certain foods and oily fish that are uh, shown to have slowed the progression of AMD in trials. Um, and then vitamin supplementation. Again, this is an important part of the management because it was shown in this, the ARIDS trial to slow AMD progression. So for dry AMD, the majority of AMD, you're going to recommend smoking cessation, dietary changes and vitamins. And then wet AMD um, is when you look at the back of the eye and in addition to drusen, you might see new vessel formation. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, when there are new vessels forming, um, those are usually friable, they can essentially burst and cause bleeding. So what you would do is that you would give intravitreal anti-VEGF, drugs like Lucentis. And the purpose of those drugs is to decrease the angiogenic drive and stop the proliferation of new vessels. So really the difference in management between these is in wet, you can kind of give something, you can give a medication. Next question. Fifteen seconds. And last five seconds. So the majority of you have gone for the correct answer, which is C, retinal detachment. Um, and the key clue in this question, so this is a 24-year-old man who's had um, essentially trauma to the head. And then he's noted bright flashing lights and a loss of the visual field. So the flashing lights photopsia are going to make you think of retinal detachment. But the real clue in this is that for some reason, the prescription of his, his refractive prescription has been put in the SBA and you can see they're very big negative numbers. So this is a person who's a high myope and being a high myope or having a big eye is a very significant risk factor for retinal detachment. Um, ocular migraine, so that's unlikely, you can have a type of migraine where you get no headache but ocular symptoms, but um, retinal detachment is more likely in this example. Um, TIA, again, this would lead to a transient loss of vision, so-called amurosis fugax, 
that the vision might return. Um, extra dual hemorrhage. Uh, so these are actually different. Sorry, these are different um, answers from the options here. So if we go through the ones here, um, posterior circulation stroke, again, with the history of trauma and being a high myope, I would not select that as the right answer. Posterior vitreous hemorrhage, um, not something that would present like this. They might have changes to the vision. You might, when you examine, there might be a mention of blood in the vitreous when you're examining them. Angle closure glaucoma is not something that presents like this. We've already covered ACG. So a bit on retinal detachment. Um, the key symptoms that you might, uh, that patient might report is new floaters, new flashing lights, and a curtain field defect. So it feels like their vision has just been covered in a curtain. Um, you might see on examination a ballooning of the retina as it's detached from the back of the eye, and it may be preceded by posterior vitreous detachment, which is where the jelly in the eye detaches at the back, might cause a degree of flashes and floaters, and usually is like a warning to the progression of RD. So the risk factors, this is very significant, I would be aware of these, but in anyone who's short-sighted or a high myope, they have a big eye, those are all the same thing, Anyone with, with marked short-sightedness, especially if you see that in the stem of the SBA, you need to be thinking about that being a significant risk factor for the development of a retinal detachment. Um, anyone with an injury to the eye, as we've just seen in the previous question, any previous or personal or family history, any previous eye surgery, any diabetes. Um, there are essentially three types, which are these, regmatogenous, tractional, and exudative. And these just refer to the different mechanisms by which the retina detaches. Generally, the management is going to be focused on vitrectomy, which is removing the jelly from the eye, and a gas or silicon tamponade of the detached retina. So you put like silicon or jelly at the back of the eye, which will be usually done by a vitreoretinal surgeon, and that will tamponade the retina to the back of the eye. This, again, more <laughs> images and clinical medicine, but I really like these, and I think they have a very strong educational value. Um, so this is a very nice photo of someone with what kind of looks like a reverse hypopion. So if you're examining someone and they had a white fluid layer at the bottom of the iris, you would think of hypopion, like pus in the anterior chamber. This is called hyperolion, which is like the reverse of that. And this is a man who had silicon tamponade of a detached retina, and it then moved forward into the anterior chamber, causing this um, very rare appearance. So I think this is a very nice paper too, if you're interested. All these images in clinical medicine are, are like 100 words anyway, so it's quite easy to read them and get a very beneficial educational um, kind of tip. Okay, next question. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. So, uh, seventy-five percent of you have selected the correct answer, which is answer C, endophthalmitis. So this is someone that's had a cataract surgery and they now have a painful red eye post-op with hypopion, which is pus in the anterior chamber. The absolute classical complication, which is very feared, I think it's one in a thousand, so it's rare, but it's certainly very feared, is called endophthalmitis. What that means is an inflammation of the whole eye. Uh, and this is a nice picture again from this link that shows a patient with endophthalmitis. You can see the eye is diffusely red, and you can see here at the inferior aspect of the uh, kind of uh, of the iris, you can see this small white collection, and that's called a hypopion. Next question.
20 seconds. Last 10 seconds. Okay, so this one is very, very spread out. 34% went for the correct answer, which is reassuring discharge. So I thought this was a very hard question. <laughs> okay, so we'll try and go through it together and then we'll talk about anisocoria. So this is a 55 year old man. He has noticed that his pupils are not the same size. The left one is bigger. So this is a person with a midriatic pupil. Okay, midriasis means dilatation of the pupil. The right eye constricts to light, but that left one that's bigger than normal does not. So we're shining light on the eye and it doesn't constrict. And then we test the accommodation reflex. So what you would do is ask, you're examining the patient looking in distance vision and then you'd say, look at my finger and you place it quite close to their face and their eyes would have to um, accommodate and then you would see constriction of the pupils. So they have near light dissociation. And the differential for near light dissociation is an adetonic pupil or an argyle robertson pupil, which is seen in syphilis, tertiary syphilis. And then it says in the five minutes after testing, um, the left pupil now is smaller than the right. So that's a very, these uh, examination findings are actually very typical um, of the AD tonic pupil, which I'll go over in a second. And it's quite a benign phenomenon and you reassure them in discharge. Going through the, oh, there's no uh, explanation, but so for the other options, um, installation of cocaine eye drops, I think that is out of the remit of undergraduate ophthalmology. Um, but essentially when someone presents with a Horner syndrome, which is another cause of an isochoria, but it would cause a meiotic pupil, not a midriatic pupil, then those patients need to be examined with cocaine to confirm horners. So I, that's wrong. Um, IV benzyl penicillin might be a treatment for tertiary syphilis. Um, really, an argyle robertson of tertiary syphilis is not really going to present with an isochoria. It's not going to be a 55-year-old person noticing that they have different colored eyes, uh, sorry, different sized pupils. Um, it's going to be someone with tertiary syphilis and other suggesting suggestive features uh, in the SBA. So I wouldn't put penicillin. This isn't an argyle robertson pupil anyway. Um, a CT autogram might be relevant for patients with tertiary syphilis. These patients can sometimes have um, uh, aortic, uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm. So that might be relevant, but obviously it's the wrong answer here. And then chest CT. Uh, so that again might be something you do if someone had a Horner syndrome and you thought that there might be thoracic pathology causing an oculosympathetic paresis. So again, not the right answer here. So the crux really to this SBA, and again, I got this wrong when I first did it. I was just like, what the hell is this? Um, the crux to this SBA is to be familiar with the examination findings of an AD pupil. So what I'm going to do is um, spend a short amount of time talking about an isochoria. Um, and then after that, there's just two more SBA. So we're nearly there, guys. Okay, so generally, um, I think these are, I mean, this is a, quite a simplistic approach, but I think if you know all these types of pathology, you've gone quite a long way to knowing about the causes of an isochoria, which means that the pupils are not the same size. So the problem can either be that the pupil is midriatic, like it's big, and that generally is because of the disruption to parasympathetic innovation to the pupil, or it could be because the pupil is small, and that's called meiosis. So the pupil will be really tiny and constricted. And that is because of disruption to the sympathetic innovation to the eye. Um, I want to just tell you all very briefly how I remember which way around it should be. Um, not to try and confuse you. This is just how I still think about it today. But essentially, if you have a sympathetic outflow to the eye, that's going to be someone who's in a kind of a fight or flight situation. So I always used to remember when I was at med school, like, okay, if I was fight or flight, if I was a caveman hunting for some food in the middle of the night back in the evolutionary days and then I was like hunting for food and then a bear found me well what would my eyes want to do well maybe my pupil would dilate so that I could get as much light in as possible so that was kind of how I remembered um, that the sympathetic innovation to the eye is responsible for dilating the pupil but what that means is that if there is a disruption to the sympathetic supply to the eye then the eye will constrict the pupil will constrict so that's why Horner syndrome particularly is due to oculosympathetic paresis. And then midriasis is the opposite, the dilated pupil. This is not like fight or flight. This is when you're like relaxing and recovering and there's lots of light around, you're relaxing. Well, the pupil is going to be really, uh, really small because you don't want to let lots of light in. So again, if there's going to be damage to the parasympathetic supply of the eye, like in a third nerve palsy, then the pupil is going to dilate because that tone that keeps the pupil constricted is lost. 
So just a very brief um, way of remembering that if you want to. You don't really need to, there are other ways to remember these things. Um, so generally, if you see someone with an isochoria, these are the key differentials. If they've got a midriatic big dilated pupil, the key differentials are going to be a third nerve palsy, generally a surgical third nerve palsy, and the AD pupil, which we've just talked about. If they're myotic, if they've got a small pupil, then you're going to be thinking about Horner syndrome and Argyle-Robertson, which is seen in the context of tertiary syphilis. And I'm going to go through each one of these. The only other one that I would add to this list that's not here is um, bilateral meiosis. Like if both pupils are tiny and pinpoint, that's obviously your, something you would see in opiate toxicity. But obviously that's slightly separate from anisocoria. Good. So um, just a brief thing about third nerve palsies. I know Yezen covered this in his uh, very enjoyable neurology lecture. I did watch it for fun. Um, essentially, just to remember that in a third nerve palsy, that's the ocular motor nerve. It's responsible for all the extraocular muscles except LR6, the lateral rectus, and SO4, the superior oblique, which are innervated by the sixth and fourth nerve respectively. So if the third nerve is paralyzed, then the eye is going to be pulled by LR6 and pulled by SO4, so it will be down and out. That's essentially what you need to know. Third nerve palsy, the eye is down and out. And then the key question is, what is the pupil like? Is it blown? Is it midriatic or not? If they have an isochoria and they have a dilated pupil, then that is going to be caused, that's called a surgical third nerve palsy. And the reason for that is that they're probably going to have some kind of lesion that's causing extrinsic compression of the third nerve, i.e. it's pushing on the third nerve from the outside in, because the fibers that subserve the pupil in the third nerve are on the outside of the nerve. So it would have to be something surgical pushing from the inside out. The classical cause of that is going to be a PCA aneurysm, a posterior uh, uh, cerebellar artery uh, kind of aneurysm, sorry, posterior cerebral aneurysm, which is going to be caught pressing on the third nerve and causing a surgical third nerve palsy. If they have a normal pupil, so there's no anisocoria, then that's called a medical third nerve palsy, and it's classically going to be seen in patients with microangiopathic disease like hypertension, diabetes. So that's just a very brief run through of third nerve palsies. Then you have the AD's tonic pupil, which is what we just discussed. I'm going to show you a very nice uh, paper that I found the other day, really, really nice pictures. But essentially, this is a midriatic pupil. There's one pupil that's big, you shine light on it, and there's a poor response to light. So it's not really responsive. You then ask them to look at their finger and accommodate, and there's a good response to accommodation. So that's called near light dissociation. And again, the differential for that is AD's or Argyle Robertson. So the classical description of AD's examination findings are a midriatic pupil, so it's big. It's got a poor, classically vermiform light response. So that means it contracts segmentally. The pupil will segmentally contract like a worm. At slit lamp, constriction is preserved. And this is caused by a loss of the parasympathetic supply to the pupil, which is what I mentioned earlier. Um, so interestingly, with the AD's pupil, the way that ophthalmologically that you confirm the diagnosis is to apply topical pilocarpine drops. And what you will see is that the AD pupil that was really big and midriatic will then overconstrict. So we'll actually go from being bigger uh, than the contralateral pupil to smaller than the contralateral pupil. And that's because of denervation hypersensitivity. It's because of that long-standing loss of the parasympathetic supply that when you install the pilocarpine, there's kind of an overreaction. And just to be aware that sometimes you might see an AD tonic pupil in the context of AD Holmes syndrome, which, it, which might be like a, in an SBA, a woman presenting with an isochoria, and then you perform a neurological examination and they have loss of deep tendon reflexes. So if you see that in an SBA, you're thinking about AD Holmes syndrome. But again, consider to be a benign phenomenon, which is why the answer in this situation was reassure and discharge. So this is a, a, a nice paper that I found, again, online. Um, a 33-year-old woman with no past medical history, she noted that her pupils were unequal in size. You can Google this paper if you like. And you can see this really nice picture. This lady has a right-sided medriasis. And they did lots of investigations and found nothing and reassured her and discharged her. This, I think, is a, a really, really nice um, set of photos. The link to the paper is here at the bottom right. That's the reference. Now, again, I'm going to take you through each panel. I don't think all of them are relevant. I'm just going to briefly show you the panels that really depict that this is an AD pupil. So if you look at the top left panel, which is where my mouse is right now, this person has a midriatic right pupil. You can see that here. The right pupil is big. Okay. Then you shine a light on the right pupil and the, the size doesn't change. So it's poorly responsive to light. Key feature of the AD syndrome. 
Then you ask the person to accommodate. You ask them to look at a near target and you can see really nicely that both pupils are now kind of equal in size. This right pupil is constricted quite a lot because the accommodation is preserved. So again, another feature of the AD pupil. And then finally, this bottom right panel, you can see that the, um, the practitioner has applied topical pilocarpine. And now you can see that the right pupil has gone from being midratic to myotic, gone from being bigger than the left pupil to smaller than the left pupil. So I just thought this was a really, really nice demonstration. So just to summarize that briefly, and I do think AD pupil is quite a rare thing. I don't think it's very likely to come up, but it's worth knowing about certainly within the remit of the curriculum. This is a person with a midratic pupil, which has a poor response to light, it might be vermiform in nature. You will then ask them to perform accommodation and they, there will be pupillary constricting bilaterally. And then when you apply topical pilocarpine, that midratic pupil will have denervation hypersensitivity and will actually look myotic. And that's your summary of the AD pupil. Um, Horner syndrome, which uh, was mentioned uh, in, the, in the question, this is, some, this is a cause of meiosis of the pupil. So the pupil won't be big, it'll be small. And remember that the other classical findings are um, remembered by the acronym MAP, M-A-P. That's how I used to remember it. So meiosis, small pupil, anhydrosis, loss of sweating because of loss of the sympathetic innovation, and ptosis. Um, and uh, I think this is a bit postgrad, but they confirm Horner syndrome with aproclonidine and then cocaine drops. And there are other drops you can apply to determine what the level of the Horner syndrome is because this is a sympathetic innovation to the eye. There are three nerves. There's the central, the preganglionic, and postganglionic level. I think it's a bit much. I don't think you really need to know the differences between them. But just remember some of the common causes. So um, when you're learning about neurology, you'll learn that there's a, the, um, a stroke syndrome called the lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. Essentially, if anyone is presenting with a stroke and they have a Horner syndrome, you must be thinking about this condition, which is due to infarction of the pica, posterior inferior cerebellar artery. It's a very classical exam question. They could also have a central tumor, like a brain tumor. Um, and then the preganglionic pre causes essentially are thoracic pathology. So Panko syndrome is a very classical syndrome where you have uh, an apical uh, adenocarcinoma that's causing, uh, imp kind of impairing the uh, sympathetic outflow. So you get a Horner syndrome. And then postganglionic causes of Horner syndrome are key ones that I would think of are internal carotid artery dissection. So anyone who's got a flexion injury of the neck that has a painful Horner syndrome in an SBA, you need to be thinking about internal carotid artery dissection. And then finally, cavernous sinus syndrome. So you'll remember that if someone has thrombosis or invasion of some kind of condition into the cavernous sinus, they may have a Horner syndrome, but they may also have multiple cranial nerve pathology because cranial nerves three, four, five A and B travel through the wall of the cavernous sinus and then cranial nerve six, the adjacent nerve goes in the middle in the blood. This is a photograph of one of uh, my patients that I saw when I was doing geriatrics. And this patient had um, a new diagnosis of lymphoma. So there was bulky mediastinal lymphadenopathy that was compressing the trachea, compressing the apex of the lung. And you can see here quite clearly that there is a partial ptosis in the right eye and the right pupil is smaller than the left. And you can see how sometimes these examination findings are quite subtle, but you need to know about these physical signs because if you don't know about them, you won't look for them. And if you don't look for them, you won't see them. This is a patient that I saw in the emergency department who presented with chest pain. I thought these were very helpful scans just to show you that this pathology really exists. So this is someone with, uh, who presented with chest pain. Um, he was a, an old man and essentially the pain was being caused by a tumor. Um, when I examined him, he had a ptosis in the left eye and meiosis. And I said, why do you have ptosis? And he said, oh yeah, it's kind of, my eyelid has drooped down a bit over the past few weeks. I don't know why. And he also happened to have uh, quite marked hypercalcemia on his blood. So I said, okay, this is someone with a new Horner syndrome and hypercalcemia and chest pain. The likely diagnosis is going to be Panko syndrome. And I got the chest x-ray and it shows a very, very dramatic uh, left apical lesion, which as you can see from the CT, was invading into lots of local structures. So I thought that'll be a really good case for learning. Um, and just a quick note on the ptosis. Uh, this is slightly outside of the realm of anisocoria, but in a third nerve palsy, classically the ptosis is complete. So the eyelid is almost completely shut. And the reason for that is that in a third nerve palsy, you have a loss of parasympathetic supply to the eye, which innervates the levator palpebrae superioris muscle, which is responsible for nine tenths of lid elevation. 
So if you lose that in a third nerve palsy, you have almost complete ptosis. Whereas in, in the Horner syndrome, the ptosis is partial, it's not complete. And that's because you have, have a loss of sympathetic innervation to the eye, which innervates the Muller muscle, which is responsible for 10% of lid elevation. So just a, a, a brief reminder that in a third nerve palsy, the ptosis is more likely to be complete, especially if it's a complete third nerve palsy. And in Horner syndrome, it's going to be partial. Um, I think this is the last bit in the nisocoria, but just about the Argyle Robertson pupil. So essentially, these aren't really patients that present with an isocoria. That's not how you'll see it in an SBA. They'll have bilateral, irregular, myosed pupils. So they'll be tiny kind of pinpoint pupils. And this is called the prostitute's pupil, quite crudely named so. And the reason is because these pupils accommodate but don't react. Again, cause of lightning association. The thought is that uh, you shine a light on the eye, nothing happens. But then you ask them to look at their finger and accommodate and the pupils will constrict. Again, caused by tertiary syphilis. Just wanted to reference this really, really nice paper by Dr. Osman. Again, very, very nice paper from Images and Clinical Medicine. If you're interested, go and watch the video. They've got examination of a gentleman with tertiary syphilis. Um, and just so if you look at this, I've taken some screenshots from the video. You can see that this person does not have an isochoria. You shine a light on the eye. This light has been on the eye for about a minute and nothing's happened. And then they ask this gentleman to look at the finger and you can see really nicely that there is bilateral constriction of the pupil. So that is a very nice demonstration of how there's loss of response to light, but constriction when you accommodate. So these, this is the classical finding in Argyle Robertson and also in the AD pupil that we mentioned earlier. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll just whiz through this, but just a brief reminder that syphilis has stages. Argyle Robertson is going to be seen in that tertiary stage of syphilis. Um, where someone might have tabes dorsalis, lancinating neuropathic pain. And the, the primary, uh, primary stage of syphilis is normally within a few weeks of exposure, where you'll have a painless gen genital shanker. So if someone has a genital lesion and it's painless, you're going to be thinking about syphilis. Uh, and then in the secondary stage of syphilis, you, get, or the, the, you might see a generalized maculopapular rash uh, with a palmar plantar predilection. And then the tertiary stage we've just talked about. So I just wanted to show you again some nice pictures from images in clinical medicine. This is the kind of maculopapular rash that it affects the hands and feet. Um, this is, I think, quite rare, syphilitic alopecia. But again, if you look at the uh, paper on the right, these are all from images. Um, you can see that this person has a palmar plantar maculopapular rash and a chancre on the lip. So um, I just think it's worth thinking about this because syphilis is definitely um, something that features in exams. Good, we only have two questions left. So this is second from last question. Ten seconds left. Okay, so uh, fifty-four percent of you have gone for the correct answer, which is decreased color vision, which is the correct answer. So, <clears throat> I think there were a few questions asking about some of the signs suggestive of, of optic neuropathy. And those are things like an RAPD, painful eye movements. This is a, this is a, a, a woman presenting with optic neuropathy. Um, palate of the optic disc might be something that you'll see in optic atrophy, which is long-standing optic neuritis might lead to that. Uh, photopsy and floaters, again, a description of uh, retinal detachment. Redness of the eye um, might, might be present in acute optic neuropathy, but is not as specific for optic neuropathy as decreased color vision. And then an arcuate visual field defect, again, not something that you would see in optic neuritis. <clears throat> so uh, just a bit on optic neuritis, it's typically rapid in onset. Um, they will commonly present with retrobulbar pain of the eye that's worse than eye movement. And again, the way I used to remember that was that if the optic nerve, which is the second cranial nerve, 
which is in the back of the eye is inflamed, then when you move your eye, it will hurt. That's quite kind of makes sense. Um, and that pain will typically precede a precipitous loss of visual acuity. You will find an RAPD on examination. Um, so I've not actually talked about RAPD in this lecture. I think it's very, very important that you know what that looks like. Um, and it's actually a very easy sign to elicit. You just swing the torch from eye to eye, and instead of constricting, one of the pupils will dilate. So please, please YouTube RAPDs so you know what they look like. Um, it's a very important ophthalmic sign. And if you see an RAPD, you need to be thinking about optic nerve disease, either optic neuritis or, for example, a retinal detachment or, for example, a retinal artery occlusion. So you need to be thinking about these causes. And then um, you will also see optic disc swelling. So that is this is the condition where you will see papillitis, like inflammation of the optic nerve head. Kind of looks like papilledema, but you can't call it that because it's not bilateral. It's not in the context of raised intracranial pressure. And then the differential diagnosis for someone with optic neuritis. Again, we mentioned earlier that in a young female, you will be thinking about multiple sclerosis causing demyelination. There's also ischemic optic neuropathy like GCA, joint cell arteritis. And then the key things that I would remember, because again, we're not going to talk about GCA in this lecture, but key things to remember in GCA for SBAs is that it affects the elderly. So if you see someone the ages of 50, 40, it's not GCA. GCA affects people who are in their 70s, people who are in their 60s. Under that age, it's very rare. So someone who's old, someone who has a headache, someone who has pain classically on touching their scalp or combing their hair, they might have optic neuritis or blurring of the disc on examination. They might have jaw claudication, which means it's kind of angina of the jaw. So when they're chewing, they get pain um, that's reproducible and goes away when they rest. Um, the classical SBA that will come up is which investigation do you need to do uh, in the acute setting or in a primary care setting? The answer would be an ESR that would show marked inflammation. And then the definitive uh, diagnosis will be done with a temporal artery biopsy. And then you treat them with high-dose steroids to stop blindness in the other eye. And there's an association with um, PMR. So pain in the muscle girdle, girdles, that's another thing that you need to be aware of. Um, and then compression to the optic nerve, if there's any like optic nerve tumor, uh, nutritional defects so, or def deficit. So B12 specifically, very common or classical cause, and then um, some other causes. But I would say the most common ones to know about are definitely optic neuritis in the context of a demyelinating episode in MS. I think this is the last one. Ten seconds. Cool. So everyone basically has gone for the right answer, which is anterior uveitis. So 23-year-old male on examination, the right pupil is smaller than the left, irregular, perilimbal injection. So that is a very classical buzzword for a finding of anterior uveitis, which we'll go over in a second. <clears throat> Again, they have hypopion, which is pus in, in the anterior chamber. And this person has progressive lower back stiffness. It's worse in the morning, relieved by exercise. That is a classical history for inflammatory back pain as opposed to mechanical back pain. They probably have uh, ankylosing spondylitis um, causing anterior uveitis. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna go to this slide first just to explain what anterior uveitis is but it's an inflammation of the anterior uvea, so the colored proportion of the eye, so the, the iris and the ciliary body. And that's why when you examine the eye, they have circumcorneal injection or ciliary injection. So what that means is that the bit around the iris is red. That's what that means. So the redness is around the cornea, like uh, that. This is a nice picture that I got, where you can see that the redness is around the cornea, 
um, and that's called ciliary injection. And then you can see again, inferiorly, you can see that collection of pus, and that's called a hypopion. Um, you might, when you examine the slit lamp, find evidence of glare, and that means there are cells, inflammatory cells in the anterior chamber, which will probably settle and then form a hypopion. <clears throat> so this is a very, very important area of ophthalmology because it is a manifestation of other systemic diseases. So patients with the seronegative spondyloarthropathies, like anxpon and psoriasis, who are HLA-B27 positive, can then have anterior uveitis. Patients with Bechet's disease, which is a kind of a multi-system inflammatory condition, HLA-B51 positive, they might have arterial and venous thrombosis, they might have orogenital ulceration, and these patients may present with anterior uveitis. Sarcoidosis, which you might see in a respiratory context, patients with worsening shortness of breath, they might have bilateral hyaluronephropathy, they might have lupus pernio on the face, so sarcoidosis, uh, hypercalcemia as well, so a key um, SBA buzzword. So that's another thing to think about if you see someone with anterior uveitis. And the final one is IBD. So patients with inflammatory bowel diseases can commonly present with anterior uveitis. These are all very, very classical exam links. And then just going back a bit, um, so just a bit on the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. As I mentioned, these are patients with HLA B27, um, and these are, you know, several conditions are encompassed by this. So patients with ankylosing spondylitis, like the man in this question, um, some of the other features you might see include aortic regurgitation, they might have acute anterior uveitis, which is what we're talking about now. This is also a cause of apical pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and classically, the pain will be worse in the morning, improved activity, improves with NSAIDs. And then you have uh, what used to be called writer's arthritis, like the reactive arthritis after an infection um, that presents with a triad of Urethritis, arthritis, conjunctivitis, which you could remember as can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. Okay, so that is one of the other seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Um, enteropathic condition, so anyone with IBD, as I already mentioned, and reactive arthritis. So, again, that's just um, the picture that I just showed you. Very classical, especially here on, on this aspect of the cornea, you can see that ciliary injection and hypopion. And that's it, we're done, we're finished. <laughs>